while Sony and Nintendo were still fighting for market dominance, other companies were still coming out of the woodwork. However, with the looming competition over the horizon, it was getting more harder to get a head start. As the years went by, companies came and fell, and others stayed, and some were gimmicky nonsense as well as others were just overpriced media consoles. However, that did not stop other companies from trying to make it in the game industry, as which we'll find out later on. On November 18th of 1998, Nintendo finally released a colorized version of the tried and true Game Boy handheld lineup. The Game Boy Color available for $80. As stated in its name, the Game Boy Color was the first handheld in Nintendo's lineup that featured a color screen. Despite other competitors beating Nintendo to the punch with color, the battery life lasted over 30 hours of gameplay with a color screen, unlike others which could barely chug it 4 hours before dying. The Game Boy Color was also backwards compatible with other non-colored Game Boy games, rejuvenating once old boring Game Boy games with 12 new users selected colorized palettes, with some that had special palettes. With a great library of games, with most from its original predecessor, including Pokemon, with the best-selling Game Boy Color game being Gold and Silver, with 14 million copies sold, the Game Boy Color sold 54 million units worldwide. The Game Boy Color wasn't the only colorized handheld attempting to fall into Japanese consumers' palms. Known for its massive fighting and arcade library and its Neo Geo console, SNK decided to penetrate the handheld market due to their failure in the console market. SNK released the Neo Geo Pocket on the same year as the Game Boy Color in 1998. However, unlike the Game Boy Color, which enjoyed a localized and worldwide release, the Neo Geo Pocket remained exclusive to Japan and other Asian cities. In synonymous with SNK's other past failures, the Neo Geo Pocket didn't break the mold, as the Neo Geo Pocket was an instant failure. With about 10 games, the Neo Geo Pocket was discontinued a year later, but SNK had a last win. Late to the party, SNK released a colorized version of their previous Japanese handheld, the Neo Geo Pocket Color, on the same year its predecessor was discontinued in 99. The $70 handheld was slightly more sophisticated than its direct competitor, the Game Boy Color. As the Pocket Color had the ability to use a calendar, a horoscope generator, and an alarm clock. However, all three of these functions required a CR2032 battery to retain backup memory and keep a system clock active. Unlike its predecessor, the Neo Geo Pocket Color was localized outside of Japan and was backwards compatible with the older Pocket titles. With the Pocket Color being only available online, the unit was eventually distributed in Walmart, Toys R Us, Best Buy, and more. With the Pocket Color being a direct competitor to the Game Boy Color, it did not surpass its sales, but it was the best-selling competitor next to the Game Boy Color. However, due to SNK's previous failures, the company was close to financial ruin. With the lack of third-party developer communication and the worldwide obsession craze with the Nintendo's newest gold mine, Pokemon, the Pocket Color was not enough to save the company. Shortly, SNK was bought up by the company Aruz, and the Pocket Color was mainly sold in Asia, and other countries were left out in the dark. SNK failed in 2001, the same year the Pocket Color was discontinued. But due to the foreseen demise of SNK, the SNK founder founded Playmore, which is the exact same company as SNK, which many have referred to this day as Playmore as simply SNK Playmore. Despite SNK having a second chance, the company has yet to release another gaming system. Despite losing to the Game Boy, SNK had a more closer competitor, Bandai. The Bandai Wonderswan was Bandai's answer to SNK releasing their Pocket lineup. Unlike the Pocket Color and the Game Boy Color, the Bandai Wonderswan was released in Japan only for a very affordable price of about $60 in USD, or 6,800 yen. Developed by the one and only Gunpei Yokoi, who left Nintendo after the Virtual Boy's failure, the Wonderswan was to be a direct competitor to the Game Boy Color and the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Unlike most handhelds, which predominantly play in landscape, the Wonderswan had the ability to be played in landscape and portrait. And with a huge library of anime-themed franchise games, it sold 1 million units in less than 5 months. 
However, the Bandai Wonder Swan was black and white, contrary to the popular colorized craze many companies were adopting. So a year later, Bandai released the Bandai Wonder Swan color, and it sold moderately well. The Wonder Swan invaded Nintendo's mainly dominated Japanese handheld monopoly, and took about 8% of their share. Bandai managed to get a deal with Square and was given the rights to port over the original Final Fantasy games with enhanced colorized graphics and improved controls. In 2002, Bandai released a visually improved version of the Wonder Swan called the Swan Crystal. However, with Nintendo's improved handheld on the way and their financial convincing power, Nintendo convinced Square back to their side and they abandoned the Wonder Swan. Bandai lost the competitive edge against Nintendo. After Gunpei Yokoi left Nintendo after his feedback was shut out from the VR32 project and during development of the Wonder Swan, he was unfortunately killed in a traffic accident. Many conspiracies have arised from this mysterious death. Some say the Wonder Swan handheld was becoming too popular and that he knew too much working at Nintendo. Others say Yakuza did it due to Nintendo's wealthy connection with Yakuza to eliminate him. Whatever the situation was, he was a pioneer and one of the people who framed Nintendo's future for decades to come. But while Nintendo, Bandai, and SNK were fighting for consumers' hands, and Sega Dreamcast and Sony were rivaling the console market, another company was trying to change the future of home entertainment and video game entertainment. With the digital video disc format rising, or DVD, and the projected use of DVD players was said to be over 100% in the next 5 years, the company VM Labs wanted to develop a new platform that DVD players could adopt. In the year 2000, Nuon Technology was born. It was a DVD platform that mainly focused on DVDs, but was a video game player secondly. Nuon Technology was a platform of a DVD video format that could also play Nuon format games. Attempting to avoid the gimmicky trap of being another multimedia playing machine, such as the Memrex VIS, Philips CDI, and the Pioneer Laser Active fell into, VM Labs' Nuon Technology unfortunately fit the mold, as they licensed out the technology similar to 3DO's planned venture. However, Toshiba and Samsung were the only ones who saw a future with Nuon's technology, both priced around $250. With the new one attempting to penetrate the video game console market, the new one form factor was a plain looking DVD player that happened to play games for the same new one platform. VM Labs wanted to bring the video game experience to DVD and movie enthusiasts. However, not all were interested, as only 30% of the entire public had a video game console in their house at this time. With only 4 enhanced new on DVD movies and 8 new on games, VM Labs filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy a year later, and the format died with the company. VM Labs was also completely oblivious to a big contender, which was also planning to play DVDs, be a video game console, and have a better library of games. The Sony PlayStation successor. Announced the same time in 99, at the same time of the Dreamcast launch, Sega was not worried, as the Dreamcast sold half a million units in two weeks. Business went on as usual. Since 1997, the public schemed about Sony releasing a successor to the PlayStation, and by the year of October 2000, the PlayStation 2 was a reality, launching in North America for $300. The console's sales, games, and accessories made Sony $250 million in the first day, passing Sega's $97 million day one launch figures by a long shot. Sega was finally getting worried. With almost 30 launch titles for the PS2 on day one, and including many later other high-profile IPs, the PS2 catered to all kinds of genre lovers and was an instant success for Christmas. Suppliers could barely keep units on the shelves for the 2000 Christmas season, and everyone instantly forgot about Sega's console that could, the Dreamcast. PS2 could play older PS1 games, DVDs, and focus on being a video game console with DVD functionality, instead of the other way around. However, due to Sega's development costs, the Dreamcast lacked DVD playback function, and was planned to be utilized in an unreleased add-on. The PS2 used a new state-of-the-art processor called the Emotion Chip, but just like the Atari Jaguar and Saturn's unfamiliar setup, developers were unsure about this new technology. 
Instead of abandoning developers, Sony embraced and helped them directly along the way with support forums and hotlines, and didn't leave them out to dry or fend for themselves. The instant success of the PS2 pushed Sega out in the cold, and with other financial problems that loomed over them, Sega was welcome to the next and final level of the console producing company. Just 18 months after the Dreamcast's proud launch, Sega sadly announced the discontinuation of the Dreamcast, and has not made a new video game console to this date, with most of their intellectual property being secured by Nintendo. With different revisions of the PS2 throughout the years, the PlayStation 2 finally breathed its last, living longer in North America than Japan by a year. Having its support dropped at the beginning of this year, after 12 years of production, the PlayStation 2 has gone the history books as the longest running console to date. After the Game Boy Color's debut, Nintendo needed to release a handheld that wasn't 8-bit. The secret project was named Atlantis. Not else was known about Atlantis but that it would be a successor to the Game Boy Color and be a 32-bit handheld that could play Super Nintendo-like games in the palm of your hand. With the release window of early 1997, it wouldn't be until 2001 when Atlantis would see the light of day named the Game Boy Advance, priced at $150. The Game Boy Advance would be backwards compatible with Game Boy and Game Boy Color titles and be able to connect with a future Nintendo console. Made to compete with the Neo Geo Color and the Swan Crystal, the GBA maintained market dominance. With only needing two AA batteries and reaching an average of 15 hours, GBA sold very well, with 41 million units selling in America and 81 million units selling worldwide. With most of the GBA's library consisting of role-playing games like the Final Fantasy series and revived classics like Super Mario Advance, the GBA was a smashing success with classic nostalgic gamers. However, in the console market, Nintendo was watching this game between Sega and Sony from the sidelines, being roughly silent only announcing a new project named Dolphin, which would be the first Nintendo product to use the compact disc and not the dated cartridge format. However, the discs Dolphin would use would be 8cm exclusive optical game discs for system memory, which could store up to 1.5GB of data, more than two times of that of CD-ROMs. However, Nintendo did not enable the now-called StarCube to play DVDs for the sake of developer learning curve. Due to the DVD-less drive, Nintendo was able to market their console $100 cheaper than the competition. On September 15, 2001, Nintendo revealed the final name for the StarCube, the Nintendo GameCube. Nintendo also showcased connectivity features of the Game Boy Advance like using the GBA as a controller or as a companion to unlock exclusive content for select GameCube titles. With its kitty purple color and small toy box size, the GameCube with only three games being included in the Japanese launch, with the most memorable being Luigi's Mansion, sold only 4 million units, but the North American launch was underway. With a proud and anticipated launch in the United States planned for November 5th, the 9-11 terrorist attacks coaxed Nintendo into delaying the launch, avoiding the GameCube being released in the shadow of the tragedy. However, this was a mistake. Being pushed to the 18th, selling only 12 million units, the reason for the lackluster launch in America was simple. The GameCube launched a few days after a new competitor's console that was out to enter the market and change the gaming world. However, during the launch of the GameCube, consumers complained from the beginning that other competitors had DVD functionality. Due to the lack of DVD capability, Nintendo offered a solution for the DVD-less console. During the GameCube's development, Nintendo struck a deal with Panasonic to produce the drive for the system. As part of the deal, Nintendo licensed Panasonic, or Matsushita, to create a Japanese hybrid version of a Nintendo GameCube which could use DVDs. It was called the Panasonic Q in 2001 for $439 and a region free version for $499. Unfortunately, due from stiff competition from others and a high price point, production for the Panasonic Q ceased to a halt two years later. After working closely with Sega on the Windows CE powered but now extinct Dreamcast, 
Microsoft gained much experience with the video game industry, working close to one of the elite duo in their heyday. After seeing Sony's success with the PlayStation 2 and the quick but mass positive reception with the Dreamcast, Microsoft realized that they wanted to make their own game system to compete with the PlayStation 2, with no one's help but their own. Since 1998, four DirectX engineers took apart a series of computers to create a prototype Windows-based game console. After much research, the team approached Microsoft game publisher Ed Fries with the Direct Xbox, which was based on Microsoft's DirectX graphics technology, which Ed supported very much. After a slew of different console names and initially rejected, Microsoft's new video game console, the Xbox, had its final market name. After many delays and fears of being compared to and failing behind Apple in regards to their game console department, Microsoft released their Xbox console on November 15, 2001, and in Japan a year later. The Xbox had its main popularity from one of its still tried and true franchises, Halo. Released alongside with other forgettable launch titles, Halo paved the way for the Xbox's success. After Microsoft acquired Bungie, which created Halo, Microsoft decided to use Halo as one of its launch titles, which still has a place as one of Microsoft's IPs to this day. Finally released a year later, Microsoft's online service, Live, was finally enabled. However, contrary to the set precedent, Live was not free and had a subscription fee for multiplayer online access. But by two months, Microsoft acquired 250,000 paid subscribers. And by 2004, Microsoft claimed their Live membership members were in the million, with a million subscribers a year. Selling with about 1.53 million units in three months, which was significantly better than the GameCube. The Microsoft Xbox was hardly able to exist on retailer shelves for the holiday season, unlike Japan, which sold poorly due to the lack of RPGs on the console. To fit popular demand, the Xbox had support for the DVD format and even had an optional DVD Xbox remote for the home theater experience. Microsoft was a new competitor in the market, along with Sony and Nintendo, and took Sega's place. Since China was the bane of many game developers' existence with its rampant piracy and ground zero for copy protection circumvention devices, Nintendo was not about to release a console there haphazardly. With the help of an engineer named Dr. Wei Yan and Nintendo support, they collaborate together to release the Shen UG, which means Divine Gaming Machine, or as what most people called it, the Nintendo IQ. With the IQ being based from its freely made N64 console, there was no console to play the games. Originally, the IQ was planned to be compatible with all previously released Nintendo titles, such as GameCube, NES, SNES, and 64. However, later in development, the IQ was mainly based and could only play N64 titles. Instead of having a main console unit like the Nintendo 64, the console was built into the controller and the games were stored on flash carts plugged into the controller directly. The IQ's strange method of distribution was a result in curbing the rampant black market piracy problem in China, as according to Nintendo, many Chinese gamers pirated ROMs or used emulators. When the IQ launched in China on November 17, 2003 for 498 yen, it came with Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Super Mario 64, and Star Fox. These launch titles came with the IQ's purchase, however they were not the full game, but just time-limited demos which could be purchased from the IQ Depot. The IQ Depot was a network of kiosks in which the user could download games, update titles, and more. Each game came with a unique code so the user could download them to their IQ flashcard. Mainly found at gas stations, the IQ Depot was also a way for players to store their games for free. However, Nintendo finally gave users a home option to download games and update their system through Fugue Online, which the user would connect their IQ to the USB and sync via the computer. Attempting to snag away gamers from the Game Boy Advance, the company Nokia decided to try something different to appeal to more of a crowd. Using the new cell phone explosion craze as a marketing tool, 
Nokia's new handheld was not just a video game handheld, but could also be used as a phone as well. Nokia said it would be MP3 and video compatible, carrying the Symbian OS 6.1. Nokia also said that their handheld would feature an arena for multiplayer play via Bluetooth and internet. Released on October 7th, 2003, Nokia finally unveiled the Nokia N-Gage to the public for an astounding and ridiculous price of about $300. With a high price point, some crippling design flaws, and cellular use only being able to be used with Singular Wireless and T-Mobile, the GBA outsold the N-Gage by a ratio of 1 to 100. One of the N-Gage's design flaws was that in order to change out a game cartridge, the battery had to be removed and replaced every time a game had to be changed. Another factor that was idiotic in the development of the N-Gage was that the microphone and speaker were located on the side of the device, resulting in any unfortunate user getting a call having to hold the phone on the side of their head, which the media poked fun at with the word TACO PHONE. While the N-Gage was a miss, many developers had interest in the N-Gage from the get-go, with games like Sonic, Call of Duty, Tomb Raider, Elder Scrolls, Splinter Cell, and more, the N-Gage was no stranger to third-party games gracing its library. However, other competitors such as Nintendo had more variety in game selection with its Game Boy Advance and its Game Boy Advance Revision SP handheld. Despite Nokia's claim that they shipped out a million units, their actual sales numbers in the United States figured about only 5,000 units. Nokia later admitted that the numbers they provided to the public were retailer numbers and not consumer purchases. This stunt was similar to Atari's scheme with the Atari Jaguar and CD add-on figures. Due to the quick negative reception of the taco shape and creating the short-lived side-calling meme, Nokia quickly scrambled to make a revision. Released in 2004 as the Nokia N-Gage QD, it was a fix for the previous mistakes in the original N-Gage. Released in a smaller, more pocket-friendly design, and having finally fixed the taco side-talking issue by moving the microphone to the face of the device, and having the cartridge slot on the bottom instead of behind the battery, it was still unnoticed by mainly everyone, and no one really cared about what Nokia had planned. The QD was a more budget-friendly version priced at $99, but having some features like MP3, FM, and USB connectivity removed. As shortly after the N-Gage was replaced, Nokia quickly changed their physical distribution priority of their games to favor towards more of a digital download experience. With a change of director and general manager from the previous Sega Europe director, Gerald Weiner, he shifted the company's focus of the N-Gage as more of a phone to play games on, instead of the other way around. Due to the change in management, Nokia had a slight turnaround with sales with games being released like Warhammer 40,000, the Rifts RPG series, and the Settlers of Catan series. The N-Gage was finally breaking even compared to losing money before. With a library of about 56 games, in 2010, Nokia finally pulled the plug on the N-Gage project, ceasing all online and N-Gage-based services to be replaced with their OV-branded store. Although the handheld phone is still sold in Chinese and Eastern Indian markets, Nokia to this day has not made another attempt to compete directly with the handheld or console market, and now works closely with Microsoft in the smartphone market. With Symbian and Palm gaining their head start in the beginning of the millennium, the company Tapwave, formed by former Palm executives, wanted to create their own game handheld to compete with the unstoppable Nintendo and others to follow. In 2003, the same month the N-Gage debuted, Tapwave released the Tapwave Zodiac for about $300. The Zodiac was marketed to be a high-performance mobile entertainment system, pretty much everything a PDA or Palm Pilot could do with media videos and more. And that was true, as the Zodiac ran Palm OS, but more of an emphasis on the video game end. Very little is known about the Zodiac, as Tapwave failed to secure strong third-party support and massive pressure from the future highly anticipated handhelds which were on their way. Tapwave was forced into bankruptcy two years later in 2005. Three years later, Sony released a standalone media consumer video device called the PlayStation X, or better known as the PSX. Released on December of 2003 for 79,800 yen, or 780 USD, its high price point made sales extremely stagnant. 
The PSX was literally a DVR with an infrared remote control, S-Video, and composite video, and having VHS and cable TV outputs. Which its final revision could be linked to a future Sony device. Little known to many, the PSX was the first device by Sony that used the popular XMB layout that other consoles after it would use. Just like the PS2, the PSX supported both PS1 and, of course, PS2 games with a slot-loading DVD drive. The PSX came in different storage sizes from 160GB to 250GB. However, due to the high price point and being marketed by the Sony Corporation instead of Sika, the PSX stayed in Japan and never saw North American shores. Predating Nintendo's secret project named Revolution by two years, a Chinese company named SSD Limited wanted to make a game console to get children and adults more active and off the couch. Their vision was creating a sister company named Zavix, which produced the one and only Zavix port. The Zavix port debuted for $70 and had the option to come bundled with Zavix Baseball. How the Zavix port worked was that the sensor was built into the console itself, and the technology that communicated with the sensor was actually built into the peripherals, such as a plastic baseball on a string or the baseball bat. The Zavix also featured tennis, which had the technology built into the racket base, which could easily be enjoyed by another human player in the same living room. Later on, Zavix released more complex games, which had a camera built directly into the game cartridge, such as bowling, which actually had a plastic bowling ball for the controller, and golf, putter and driver included, and an extra sensor that the user placed under the club, which analyzed your swing. Eventually, Zavix became slightly more popular, getting a deal with Jackie Chan to assist in a Zavix boxing game, which used wearable gloves as the controllers. Even though, as stated before, this technology predated Revolution by two years, the gameplay on some games, such as bowling and golf, were below average, while some, such as tennis and fishing, which use a lifelike rod and reeling rumble effect to simulate fish pull, were better than some Revolution games offered later on. Despite being slightly superior to Revolution, the graphics on the Zavix port looked to what the Super Nintendo would have looked like if the CD add-on materialized. Slightly lower than 32-bit, but not as good as other competitors or consoles. The company Zavix and SSD Limited are still around, but most of their website has broken domains, and their hardware is mainly sold through other online retailers. While many stories of companies releasing their consoles and devices and seeing their ideas come to life in the market, many visionaries had their ideas never leave the drawing board or got past the planning stages. Here are some of their stories of what we like to call vaporware. Infidium Labs was the company founded in 2002 by Tim Roberts, who originally made keyboards for computers. In 2003, Infidium released a press conference saying it would unveil a revolutionary game platform that would feature an on-demand video game service through an online subscription. However, due to the unprofessional language and usage of slang during the press conference, no one really took it seriously. The device was said to be able to play current and planned PC titles, already giving the Phantom a promising library of games. The Phantom was to be able to use a direct download content delivery service compared to the physical media such as CDs and the now extinct cartridge. In 2003, future press conferences claimed the Phantom would be for sale that year, and the DRM would go through DiskStream or digital interactive systems. The Phantom was finally seen for the first time at E3 in 2004, which allegedly showed it playing Unreal Tournament 2004. Whether this was actually a concept version of the Phantom, or a PC just being mirrored to a monitor, has been debated to this day. Very little is known about the Phantom, as rumored that only 300 people were allowed to view the Phantom in action at a specific E3 booth. A source from a game editor who actually saw the Phantom up close said that most people who were viewing the Phantom ran game stores, so the quote that Infinium boasted that you would never need to buy games again was met with very awkward and negative silence. According to the editor, the Phantom had a nice looking and easy to navigate interface. The problem was that nothing happened, and when it did, the Phantom froze. 
Later on, the representative at the Phantom booth later admitted that the hardware wasn't there yet anyway. The case being displayed was just a shell that was connected to a PC behind the scenes. Whether this information is true or accurate or not has yet to be proved though. According to the only eyewitness report of the E3 demonstration, the Phantom representative was surprised that the editor was still there, as most people left within 20 minutes or so. Shortly afterward, the editor exited the booth and followed suit. And not much else is known about the E3 demonstration except this video above. On the same year, the Phantom specs and price point were announced, with it being below $399. The Phantom had the ability to use customized hardware and centered gaming content service PhantomNet for $9.95 a month. A final sale date was set for 2004, and just like 2003, it was missed. Later making more empty claims saying the Phantom would be ready for market on the holiday season of November, even though PhantomNet was not ready to be released. As expected, this deadline was also missed. Infintium was now claiming with thousands of faxes that the release was scheduled on January, which later became March of 2005. With the limited public who cared enough to stay up to date with the Phantom in outrage, the CEO hinted the console would be released alongside a very previously successful console successor, but missing that date as well. This was the last time an announcement for the Phantom was made public, and by next year, the Phantom listing was removed from their website. After a $73 million deficit and a failure to pay it back, the Phantom Game Console prototype was finally laid to rest. With many financial loopholes including penny stock and hiding from the SEC, shockingly enough, with only three employees, the company Phantom Entertainment still exists to this day, creating lap boards for PC and went public on the stock market in 2012. Alongside Phantom, trying to cross the bridge between PC and game console was a company named Digital Interactive Systems, also known as DIS. They set out to allow console gamers to play computer PC games on a console that was not really a game console, powered by Microsoft Windows XP. The technology was called Discover. Discover would have revolutionized the gaming industry with its promises it intended to bring. Discover would allow thousands of pre-made scripts to configure game requirements when inserting a PC game. No need to manually adjust your graphics card resolution, input configuration, or other tweaks. Discover also featured Drop and Play, which would have a server connection via dial-up or broadband which would send the console mods or script updates, creating a somewhat always online architecture. Does that sound familiar? As in regards for DIS profiting from Discover technology, DIS decided to take the tried and troubled path of licensing out the technology to third-party developers. With many meetings with multiple big-name companies such as Hyundai, Gateway, Alienware, HP, and Dell, DIS finally got their big break, with Apex being the first to bite on the Discover technology. At CES in 2004, Apex and DIS were proud to display the Apex Dream, running Discover technology. It featured a 40GB hard drive, DVR, and HD TV support. However, due to the financial instability of Apex and lack of funds, the Apex Dream never materialized. But Discover Technology was finally featured in two Alienware Media Center PC models in 2005, accomplishing a little further than what the Phantom could not. Besides being featured in two Media Center PCs, Discover Technology has been abandoned and the website is now defunct. Rumored to have run Nuon Technology, John Gildred's project, the Andrema L600, was said to be the first open source video game console with PC hardware and the ability to run Linux. With a slated release for the year 2000, Andrema had nothing to show but press releases. The L600 was to be MP3 compatible and be a CD slash DVD with DVDR like capabilities, and would cost about $300 for 30 launch titles starting out. The Andrema was set to be more friendlier towards free software, with a service developer kit at no charge, compared to other companies at the time charging up to $10,000 to use theirs. The Andrema also favored expandability, as the L600 had the ability to remove the graphics processor and install a more efficient one if the user wished. However, many had little hope for the L600's future, as the Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox, and Nintendo's GameCube highly dominated the gaming market, with no room for visionaries for an open-source console world. 
Due to the lack of funds and the $10 million capital required to make the Indrema L600 a reality, Indrema shut down in 2001, with John Gildred giving out some fantastic advice at Indrema's last press conference. Finish product before talking about it. Next time on the History of Video Games. Microsoft jumps the gun with the new Xbox successor, and Nintendo will find themselves a new enemy in the handheld market, Sony. Nintendo will also teach us that touching is good. That and much more to come next time on the History of Video Games. See you later!